I'll begin with a reading from uh, Thomas Cramner's Collects, a Collectives of Prayer in the Anglican Church. And uh, a little history behind this one. A new emphasis on Holy Scripture at the time of the English Reformation is seen in this Collect, which is original composition of Archbishop Cramner. His preface to the 1549 prayer book and retained in the current American prayer book under the historical documents is well worth reading. He describes the situation inherited by the Reformers, the venerable practice of reading the whole Bible through in a year of public worship had become altered, quote, altered, broken, and neglected, end quote. The form of the collect is unique. The address is made to the Father as blessed Lord. The pleading clause is missing at the end. The present ending, Colossians 1.27, reflects the belief that every part of Scripture bears witness in some way to Jesus Christ. And so the collect reads, Blessed Lord, which hast caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us that we may in such wise hear them, read them, mark, learn, and inward di inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of thy holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which thou hast given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. It is... Uh, our pr privilege to have Dr. Theodore P. Letus here from the Renaissance and Reformation Biblical Studies. I have known Ted for over 20 years. He's a rigorous scholar and a dedicated believer. Ted has been a steady champion of the faith in all the years that I have known him. We first met through Dr. David Otis Fuller when Ted was a budding master's student at Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. We became better acquainted through conferences and collaborating, collaborating on published projects as he completed his master's work at Emory. Later, he was a personal tour guide when I visited him during his doctoral studies at Edinburgh. He is the past president of the University of Edinburgh Theological Society and is currently a member of the Society of Biblical Literature, where he served on the steering committee for the History of Interpretation section. He's a member of the American Academy of Religion, where he is currently part of the seminar, uh, Historical Consciousness and its Impact on the Christian Churches. Member of the American Society of Church History. He has a PhD from the University of Edinburgh in Ecclesi Ecclesiastical History and an honors MTS from Emory University in American Church History. He has completed graduate studies at Westminster Seminary, Philadelphia, St. Charles Borromeo Seminary, Philadelphia, and Concordia Theological Seminary, Fort Wayne, Indiana. He holds the BA degree in Biblical Studies and History from Evangel College, with additional undergraduate studies completed at Southwest Missouri State University. He has authored and edited several books, including the majority text, Essays and Reviews in the Continuing Debate, second edition, and the Ecclesiastical Text, Text Criticism, Biblical Authority, and the Popular Mind, second edition. Ted has also had an extremely active lecturing schedule in his career. A synopsis of those includes, he has lectured before the Evangelical Theological Society, presenting his paper, B.B. Warfield's Common Sense Philosophy and New Testament Criticism. Also lecturing before the Scottish University's Ecclesiastical History Conference, as well as the Theological University in Campen, to the English Department and Medieval Studies Department at Trinity College, Dublin, and finally to the annual in international meeting of the Society of Biblical Literature in Berlin, Germany last year. And we're pleased to continue uh, with Dr. Letus. Thank you. Okay, uh, here we see on the screen, volume one of Burgon's 16 volumes, index of patristic citations found in the British Museum. Uh, and here he compiled uh, in an inexhaustive way, all the quotations of the Orthodox early fathers from the text of Scripture that they were using in order to show that the text that w acted as their Bible was the same text that has come down in the transmission of the Byzantine text type. Um, and that's the kind of labor. It was never published uh, and went straight into the archives of the British Museum. But the findings that are found there were published 
posthumously in two volumes that Edward Miller compiled after Bergon had died. So that gives you an idea of the kind of labor that Bergon uh, used in, in uh, bringing the evidence to bear on this controversy. But now we're going to talk about uh, Edward F. Hills. Um, I first read Dr. Hill's book uh, in 1974, I believe, and I decided at the time I was reading it that I was going to read Hills and Metzger side by side and see, uh, see uh, if they diverged in their understanding and the interpretation of the evidence and if they brought the same kinds of evidence to bear in their arguments. And I, find out, I found out immediately that, that Hills was shoulder to shoulder with, with Metzger every time he tackled a textual variation. And that they, they cited the same evidence, but they would interpret the evidence differently. And it was years later as I, I discovered that Hills actually knew Metzger, that they had been together at the University of Chicago during one summer taking textual criticism. And uh, Metzger will come into the story again in just a few minutes, but... Uh, in this exercise, I did find only one divergency. I found that uh, Hills had referred to one old Latin manuscript as an A manuscript, and I believe uh, Metzger had referred to it lowercase b, or vice versa. I don't remember, but it was an old Latin manuscript. And so I wrote my first letter ever to Dr. Hills to ask him if he would be able to clarify this, this uh, discrepancy between the two authors. And he wrote back uh, effusively thanking me for pointing out a typographical error that I had discovered in his work. He said that hadn't been there in his first edition, but somehow had gotten in there in a later edition. And uh, that was my introduction to, to Dr. Hills. And, and when, when I finally went off to college as a late undergraduate, something like Bergon was, I was 25, he was 28. Um, he invited me up to spend uh, the, the weekend with him and get to know him and, and to talk about textual criticism. And so I took him up on his invitation and, and caught the Greyhound bus from Springfield, Missouri up to Des Moines, Iowa. And he and his lovely wife, uh, Marjorie Hills, who's seated over there, picked me up at the Greyhound bus station and ferried me to their home and... Uh, uh, he gave me a little tour of his office, and, and we immediately sat down in his front room, I on the couch and he in an overstuffed chair, and uh, a conversation began that went on unremittingly throughout the rest of the day. And uh, it, it, it's still such a vivid memory in my mind how that uh, as lunch time would roll around, Mrs. Hills would set an entire table, we would get up, from our living room seats, go into the dining room, sit down. Dr. Hills would pull his big King James out of the sideboard, sit down and read from the scriptures. Then we would pray, have a wonderful meal, and then he and I would wash the dishes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we did. <laughs> on, on this occasion, anyway. And, and then, and then we would resume our seats in the living room. And it would go on into the evening, and then the same thing would happen with the evening meal. And then finally, uh, on into the, the late hours of the evening, and we would retire and reassume our position the next day. And, uh, and then I would go home. And this happened on several occasions. And uh, it was on one of those tutorial sessions that uh, Dr. Hills brought me around from my uh, synergistic ways, my... Arminian ways to accepting the uh, idea of the absolute and complete sovereignty of God, and I became a monergist. That is to say that I came to understand my salvation was not a result of some decision that I made, but rather I had been given through prevenient grace the ability to accept uh, the gift of, of Christ's atonement and, and uh, embrace salvation. Uh, he, I, in fact, I can tell you that the first time I ever read the debate between Luther and, and, and Erasmus on the bondage of the will and the freedom of the will, I never got around to reading Luther because I only read Erasmus because he was telling me what I already believed. 
And I went through Erasmus and underscored it and never even read, never read uh, uh, Luther in his rebuttal to, to Erasmus. But Hills put a simple proposition to me on one of those occasions. He said, do you believe that God created the universe? And I said, yes, of course I do. And he said, do you believe he controls what happens in the universe, the heavenly bodies and so forth? And I, yes, yes, I believe that. Well, if you think he created the universe and he's the sovereign God of the universe, why is it he would have nothing to do with uh, your salvation? And um, if he controls everything else, why would he not be in control of that? And I pondered that and pondered that and pondered that. And uh, finally, he went back and read Romans chapter 9. And I realized that Paul was, in fact, saying exactly what Dr. Hills had said. Then I went back and read Luther's Bondage to the Will and realized that there was a wonderful continuousness from what Paul actually taught to what Luther actually taught to what Professor Hills was teaching on soteriology. So, I mean, that was a very momentous event as well as all that I learned from him about text criticism. Every, everything I read in his book uh, that I had questions about the personages, the individuals, the historic players. I would ask him about them, and he would give me a full, contextual, exhaustive answer. Who was Wettstein, and, and did he really, why did he defend the Byzantine text? Well, he wasn't really a Byzantine text defender, but he liked it because of this reason. And, and, and he, he was a master of the history of text criticism. And if you'll read his three essays that appear in the Journal of Biblical criticism, uh, journal of biblical literature, there were three chapters from his dissertation that he wrote at Harvard. They're just brimming over with all kinds of Latin sources and, and sources, obscure sources I had never seen and never saw anyone else quote from in the history of textual criticism. He was an absolute master of the history of the discipline. He understood how it developed, what was the theological viewpoint of every practitioner as the history of the discipline developed. I mean, and you don't even get a fraction of that in his books, because he realized if he went into that in the kind of detail he was capable of going into, no one would ever read his books, because few have read his essays. Again, the same problem that Bergon had. He had mastered a discipline that very few people could appreciate when he presented the evidence that he had uh, d discovered. So um, when I went off to seminary, um, I, I was thinking about going to Westminster because that's where Hills had gone. Um, that's where Machen had been. Uh, he talked me into thinking about applying to Harvard. And, of course, I did that. I applied to Harvard Divinity School. And uh, he wrote a wonderful letter of recommendation. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't think that I was Harvard material, and so they didn't accept me. And he, uh, he took it rather personally. He said, I... I hope that my letter was not the kiss of death to you. Um, and I said, no, I don't think it is. It might have something to do with my GPA. <laughs> Which wasn't bad, but it wasn't sterling, if you will. So I ended up going to Westminster. And while there, I made a very deliberate decision to write an essay about Dr. Hills's life for one of my classes. Because nobody at Westminster knew Hills who had been there uh, with Machen in the early days. And before I could get, and I wrote him and I said, would you mind summarizing in a memoir how you came to your position while you were at Westminster? And he very kindly did that. And um, uh, before I could get around to writing the essay, the Lord took him away from us all. And uh, it was then that I made a very deliberate decision that I would write my master's thesis on his life. And uh, uh, toiled away, uh, spinning my wheels at Westminster, which, which was not the institution it was when Hills was there. To my dismay, I didn't find out until I arrived what tatters that institution was actually in. And for, for, but for four years, I, I labored away as a part-time student and finally transferred to Emory University, which was an exceedingly good move because there I was allowed to write my thesis on the life and the, the work of, of Hills. And um, I want to now give you a, a little background on his life and how he came to his theories. And this will be taken from the published form of my master's thesis written at Emory, as, as it's found on the table over there.
As a young man, Edward Hill showed a great interest in the Bible, being strongly influenced by a very evangelical Sunday school teacher. He devoured such works as Matthew Henry's commentaries, reading them over and over again. He knew all the kings of Israel, just like a person from the United Kingdom knows all the kings of England. He also knew all the battles from the Old Testament. As a youngster, his father taught all the children the Lord's Prayer and the Shorter Catechism and required the other portions of Scripture to be memorized as well while sitting quietly in a chair. His father wrote poetry and his library of literary classics and glass-covered bookcases reached to the ceiling. If his father arrived home in the evening and found the children fooling around and making a ruckus, he would say, go get yourself a book, and that was the way things were settled. <laughs> Hill's brother recalls that Edward, quote, didn't take part in too many social activities, unquote, though he was quite athletic, lifting weights, playing high school football, jogging at night or early morning, even after going off to seminary and he was on the crew team at, at Yale. He, uh, he graduated uh, with distinction from Oak Park High School. By the way, he was reared in a uh, uh, Frank Lloyd, Lloyd Wright home that had been built, especially um, for uh, Hill's family, uh, which was quite a mark of distinction. O Oak Park being a very exclusive area in Chicago, as you probably know. Uh, he graduated from Oak Park High School. He entered Yale as a classics major in 1930. And his philosophy professor at Yale assessed him in the following terms as, quote, an outstanding student in philosophy, very serious-minded, and an excellent person. He was very well balanced, thoroughly adjusted socially, and cultivated with respect to his sentiments and tastes, unquote. Uh, he was a scholar of the second rank in his freshman and sophomore years and attained the first rank his junior year. As a junior, he also won three out of five prizes in Latin and Greek. He won the John W. Corwith Memorial Scholarship Prize for Excellence in Latin, the first prize in the annual Lucius F. Robinson Latin Award for Special Profic Proficiency in Latin, and he shared the Noyles Cutter Prize in Greek. He graduated summa cum laude and delivered the annual Ivy Ode oration on graduation day, uh, a commencement that saw Delanor Roosevelt receive an honorary doctorate. And of course, the Ivy Ode was uh, a poem he was to write and read at the commencement in Latin. He was also elected to the Pi Beta Kappa Society. So you could not have a more uh, celebrated and, and sterling career as an undergraduate than that. I, don't, I simply don't know how you could have matched that. It, it was a stunning uh, uh, showing as an undergraduate at Yale University. He then um, decided to go off to seminary. And this is a very interesting chapter in his life. And I'm going to read again from the narrative. It was while at Yale that he established a, a relationship with J. Gresham Machen. The split with Princeton had occurred while Hills was still in high school. At Yale, he immediately aligned himself with an Orthodox Presbyterian church and invited Machen to come to Yale to speak. His enthusiasm for Machen was immense. For example, for example, Edward and his brother, Greer, were rooming at the YMCA while Edward was taking graduate courses at the, the Divinity School when their parents came for a visit. Greer overheard them trying to persuade Edward to attend Princeton Seminary, but Edward was already determined to sit under Machen at Westminster. You've got to keep in mind that Westminster did not have the reputation it has today. It really was regarded as kind of a backwater, little breakaway, renegade institution that was headed up by this uh, rampaging Orthodox uh, defender, Machen. And so it didn't have the kind of reputation, obviously, that Princeton has, and well, it still doesn't have the reputation of Princeton, but it's headed in that direction, I can tell you that. Uh, and, and here Greer recalls, and this is oral history I was able to get from Edward's brother, and I quote, I think that they were trying to get him to do 
get, what they were trying to get him to do was go to Princeton Seminary. And they were very much alarmed when he said that he wanted to go to Westminster Seminary. And his reply was evidently to something they had said. I just heard his reply as they were rather soft-spoken, but his reply was quite vociferous. And he said, quoting from Philippians, there are many contentions, but Christ is preached. And that was his reply to my folks. And so the next year, he enrolled at Westminster Seminary to be with Machen. Machen may have influenced uh, Hill's theological consistency. He saw Machen as a champion who had risked all to protest the drift that ultimately reorganized Princeton and founded Westminster. Like Machen, Hills had established himself as a classicist, the better to join into the fray. Siding with Machen, he hoped to make his own contribution to the new coalition. In his letter of application to Westminster, he expressed himself to Machen in the following terms. And I'm not going to read all of this, but it's very interesting to see him interacting with Machen, who was considered the father of the modernist fundamentalist movement controversy. Hills. I might mention a few ver views that I've acquired during the last several years that I've spent here at Yale. Of course, it goes without saying that any religion that is to claim adherence with whom I wish to number myself must have a rational basis. A collection of irrational fanatics is one of the worst gathering places for sin that I know of. Well, to go on, Christianity for me must be rational, and after some struggle, I have come to the view that it is. I would like to win people on the same basis. To me, at the present time, there seems to be two provinces which the devil has made into the intellectual fortresses of unbelief into which the average infidel runs for shelter. If these can be demolished, of course, it, uh, it is too much to expect him to believe, but at least he is driven to stick his head into the sand like the ostrich, which is the more absurd posture and surely much must afford less comfort by far than his former complacent uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, ensconchment in what he fondly imagined to have been a fortress. The first of these fields is one in which the main battle will always continue. But in recent years, however, an ambush planted in our rear threatens to annihilate us. It is hard to tell. I would like to fight. I would like to fight on both sides, that is, run from the front to the rear and to the front again. Your seminary is one of the few that is, going, that is doing any fighting. That is why I am applying for admission. In most seminaries, the champions are so benumbed by the hostile blows as almost to go comatose completely. The greater part have cracked under the strain and, and run daft around the field of battle. Uncle Sam ought to padlock these. The rest ought never to have left the house incapable, unable to live anywhere without a respirator to say nothing of battle. Well, I have been rattling on in a fastidious vein. It is only because I know you already look upon this as a personal letter. Now these fields of endeavor concerning which I have been commenting upon at length Carried away by my attempts at informal presentation, I find that I have treated with such easy familiarity as not to even name, which may seem to you singular. To be specific, and he's saying there are two areas that are going to consume his attention. The first province is that of New Testament criticism, the historical problems of the New Testament. This I would like to make my life study if I am found capable. The second is that which is formed by the problems which arise from the first chapters of Genesis, including the refutation of evolution. These, as I have said before, are the two fulcrums upon which the average man leans his load of unbelief. Knock these out, and, well, no more metaphors. But anyway, one ought to make converts. So there is his vigorous enthusiastic letter to Machen telling him that I want to join the fray, I want to be a champion of orthodoxy, and my two fields of endeavor will be New Testament text criticism and the theory of Darwinianism. And if you will read his works, which are on the table over there, 
you will find that indeed these are the two areas that he made his lifelong study. Now, several, several years after Hills graduated from Westminster, uh, he earned his doctorate in New Testament text criticism. And then, uh, he, he, as I say, had three articles published in the uh, Journal of uh, uh, Biblical Literature. But before he went off to Harvard, he did a master's degree at Columbia down in Decatur, where I live. And then he went to the University of Chicago. But upon arriving in the University of Chicago, he could have no idea that one of the letters he got, a letter of recommendation written by one of his professors from Columbia in Georgia, had alerted the man who would be his supervisor to the fact that Edward Hills was a staunch uh, defender of orthodoxy and sometimes even challenged the orthodoxy of his professors at Columbia. And all of this was in the letter of introduction that E.C. Caldwell read that Hills never knew had been written. I got access to that letter because when I wrote my master's thesis, I asked Mrs. Hills if I could have permission, a letter of permission, to read all of his files at every institution where he had studied. And when I unearthed this letter, it became painfully clear to me why he had an unsuccessful career at Chicago, even though he had a glowing career at Yale, a wonderful career at Westminster, a solid career at Columbia. But when he got to the University of Chicago, Caldwell, who was a, a Quaker, a exceedingly liberal Quaker, was not particularly interested in seeing Hills succeed while he was there. Hills was there for several terms. He took all of his language studies. He took all of his core courses. And when it came time to, to provide a proposal for his PhD dissertation, he was going to do a study on von Soden's K-text, which was another term for the Byzantine text, and show how the recently discovered papyri from the third century overturned the Westcott and Hort theory because the third century papyri that had been discovered in Hills' lifetime had many readings in it that justified the Byzantine text. And this is what he was going to show in his dissertation. But since Caldwell had no intention of allowing him to write uh, a dissertation, he declined his proposal and his um, request to do a PhD dissertation was denied. And for a man who had graduated with a kind of glowing celebration that Hills had received at Yale, to be humiliated this way by Caldwell was, was so devastating you cannot imagine. There's no way you can measure the psychological and emotional effect this must have had on Hills. It would have broken a lesser man. I can absolutely assure you of that. But because he was so tenacious, and anyone I interviewed and, uh, who said anything about him, you know, sometimes they would describe that tenaciousness in a less than flattering way, but that's all right, because, because temperamentally, if he didn't have that tenaciousness, he would not have had the courage to not only not give up, but simply turn around and make application to Harvard University to start all over again, which is exactly what he did. Without even mentioning his... Uh, the disappointing experience at the University of Chicago. He ap applied at Harvard Divinity School and was readily accepted. Only this time, the man he had as a supervisor, ironically and interestingly enough, was also a Quaker, Cadbury, but he was a Quaker of a more congenial and uh, open-minded disposition, and he saw that Hills was an extraordinarily talented man and said, I will put him to work and they gave him a different dissertation topic. He wrote a first-class dissertation on the Caesarean text type. The, uh, uh, the research was so solid that it continues to be referred to by text critics today. Even though they don't accept his views in his published books, they know that the groundwork to these books and the work he did at Harvard is absolutely first-class that he did groundworking, breaking work. He showed that the harmonizations in the Caesarean text type in the book of Mark. Others went on to show that there were harmonizations in the so-called Caesarean text in other books as well. So he graduated a full-fledged text critic and had three essays published in the Journal of uh, Biblical Literature. 
Uh, he then realized that uh, uh, he had to fulfill an obligation that while he was at West Westminster, he had made to Stonehouse. Stonehouse, of course, was second in line from Machen in the New Testament department. Stonehouse, when he discovered Hill's talent after he got his doctorate from Harvard, Hill sent him off prints from his journals and asked Stonehouse if he wouldn't please read them and give him some feedback. Stonehouse's reply was that, unfortunately, Hills was writing beyond the purview of his knowledge and couldn't give him any feedback. The, the student had surpassed the teacher at this point, but said, you, you, should, uh, you should write a book on this subject because there's nobody who has brought a distinctively Calvinistic approach to textual criticism. And you're the man to do this. You ought to write a book about this, which Hills did. The title of the book was Text and Time, A Reformed Approach to New Testament Text Criticism, a very gripping, engaging title. He sent the manuscript to Baker Bookhouse right here in Grand Rapids, Michigan, Pat, uh, where, uh, where uh, it was uh, looked at and farmed out for peer review. And interestingly enough, the man who actually encouraged him to write the book, Stonehouse, was one of the men asked to read the manuscript. And he had already admitted, and I documented in here in a letter to Hills, that he didn't understand text criticism very well, and therefore couldn't give him any feedback on his essay. But here he was asked to judge whether Hills had made his case in defending the authorized version in this book. Uh, and the book was also sent out to Bruce Manning Metzger. And Metzger was asked to give his opinion of the book. Metzger, after I interviewed him at Princeton, told me in no uncertain terms, and is documented here in my thesis, that he wrote back and told Mr. Baker that he ought not under any circumstances to publish such a book. And it was on Machen's recommendation that Hills received a rejection letter from Baker Bookhouse. Now this is very, very telling. Since they were students together at the University of Chicago, they both became legitimate text critics earning the final terminal degree in that field. Uh, you can see that they were competitors in, in one respect. Metzger had gone down the Horsian Road, Hills had gone down the Burgon Road, and never the two were to meet. But uh, the one good thing that came out of the interview with Metzger, besides finding out that he was responsible for the book not being published, was that he sympathized with Hills for having been dismissed from the University of Chicago. And he offered a sympathetic note about it was, it was a very harsh and unfair treatment that Hills had received at the University of Chicago. And I was very pleased that Metzger was fair on that point, that, on that point and that that is part of the public record now. Uh, because there are some people who want to uh, claim that there was some kind of incompetence, incompetency on the part of Hills, when in fact we know it was a political move. Pastor, yes. I believe you said that uh, the rejection of the book proposal to Baker, the manuscript, was made on the basis of Machen's uh, refusal. Uh, I think you met Metzger, didn't you? Thank you very much. Yeah, that's what I thought. Thank you very much. It's been a long weekend, my friends. Let the record show that it was not Machen. It was Bruce Manning Metzger, who I interviewed at Princeton Seminary. Thank you very much. That would have been a colossal error. All right, to continue the narrative. So <clears throat> what was Hills to do? Well, he self-published. And it's just an indictment on the evangelical world and the publishing world, even at that state, that forced him to do that. He changed the title to make it more accessible since he no longer had to uh, please an academic peer review committee. He titled the book, The King James Version Defended, A Christian View of the New Testament Manuscripts. And uh, it came out in 1956, an exquisite study. Uh, I have all, mo many, most of the major reviews of that book as, as, as they appear published uh, here, acknowledged in my study. But most, most of them were very, very positive reviews. They lauded his ability and the fact that he was attempting to integrate 
his reformed review with the discipline of text criticism. I went to Westminster and took Stonehouse's copy, Hill sent Stonehouse a copy, off of the shelf, which they have at Westminster, and, and took note of Stonehouse's uh, uh, annotations in the margins. He went through the book twice because I noticed that sometimes there was pencil and sometimes there, were, there was ink on the same margin. And he made all kinds of uh, fumbling comments, misunderstanding what Hills was saying, and it was evident that Stonehouse didn't uh, grasp what Hills was, was up to. And uh, in fact, and, and this was a, a tremendous uh, injustice, I think, Stonehouse should have at least reviewed it in the Westminster Theological Review. He's the one that encouraged him to write the book. But because he didn't like the, co the conclusions to which Hills came, the book was never even reviewed in the journal of his alma mater, even though Stonehouse had read it. And I think that's, uh, that's very, very uh, bad form. There's absolutely no justification for that. They were giving him the silent treatment. They just wanted him to go away, but he wasn't going to go away. The book has been continuously in print since 1956 and has had tremendous influence on any number of people. And to show you this is something I wanted to talk about last night very briefly. I want to show you the ethos that was old Westminster as compared to contemporary Westminster and how Hill's research was completely in tenor with old Princeton. This is a book that came out in 1948. It is a critique of the Revised Standard Version by this man, Oswald T. Alice, who went to Germany, University of Berlin, and got a PhD in Old Testament studies and wrote the most devastating critique of the RSV that was ever written at that time. And this is what he said in his assessment of the RSV. In summary, quote, if by a liberal version is meant a version which represents a lax and liberal attitude to the question of the plenary verbal inspiration and the divinity, divine authority of Scripture, then RSV is clearly such a version. Sufficient evidence has been given in the preceding pages to show that it is governed by a very different conception of what is meant by an accurate version from that to be found in the authorized version. Now there is the supreme authority on biblical studies at Westminster giving an unqualified thumbs down to the RSV claiming it is a liberal version in 1948. Hills comes along and says the same thing regarding the New Testament as an authority in the field of text criticism and his book is utterly ignored by Westminster Seminary. In fact while I was there as a student I could not find this book on the library shelves at Westminster. Not only were they giving Hills the silent treatment, they wanted to give Old Westminster the silent treatment. I finally discovered that this was in special holdings in a back room somewhere, uh, and the justification for putting it there was because they didn't want it to be lost. The book was a 1948 publication. This is not, a, 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 this is not an antiquarian book. The reason it was back there is because they didn't want their students infected by the teachings of the professors who founded the seminary. And how ironic that Vern Poitras, now on the faculty, I believe he's chair of New Testament there, <clears throat> is on the revision committee of the English Standard Version, which is 91% the Revised Standard Version. So you can see how far Westminster has drifted since the days of Hills and O.T. Alice. Um, well, listen, uh, let's open things up now for questions, and um, I'd like to hear what you think about Hills, or if you have any questions about his career, or his life, or his publications. Everyone's read this already, haven't you? You already know about him. Mr. Spees.
Yes. The question is, did David Otis Fuller and Edward Hills ever meet? I, uh, you know, the person to ask would be Mrs. Hills. We might actually put her on the spot here. I, I, they obviously did correspond um, because uh, Dr. Fuller published one of Hills' uh, essays in his first book on this subject called Which Bible? And it may have been the first time I'd actually heard Edward Hills' name is when I read that book. Um, so they obviously did correspond, but did they ever meet Mrs. Hills? They did meet. And what were the circumstances of their meeting? Fuller came to Dr. Hills' church. Ah, Dr. Hills came to Dr. Fuller's church and spoke there on a couple of occasions. Baker was willing to publish the book under one condition. Uh, he would uh, attempt to sell it for one year, and if it did not sell adequately, uh, we would receive the whole shipment. He would send us the whole shipment. Furthermore, uh, he demanded that uh, ba Baker receive the, uh, I mean, Baker Bookhouse demanded the uh, copyright of the book. And that we would not accept because had he consented to uh, give up the copyright, he would never have been able to publish his own book. So uh, we said no. And uh, Zondervan would not publish it. Uh, neither would, um, who's the other major public? Erdman's? Uh, uh, Erdman's, yes. They would not publish it. So we were left with the all, only alternative to publish it ourselves. And we have done it, and we have kept it in print for all these years. And when I am no longer able to print it, my daughter here, she will keep it. This book will stay on the market as long as time lasts. We have, even my granddaughter has said, we will keep that book in print, Grandma. We will. We will do it. So it, it will endure. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you for that. I, I, let me add one other little a note uh, to this story. Uh, Dr. Leavis has told you about uh, my husband's experience at the University of Chicago it, uh, and how Colwell uh, would not, uh, frankly told him, Hills, with your views, you will not receive a PhD. We will not give it to you. Interestingly enough, um, when we were down south uh, ministering in a Presbyterian church there, uh, my husband received a letter from Colwell uh, asking him to do some collating for him. And uh, he told me, he said, oh, I've gotten this letter from Colwell and asked me to do this collating. And I said to him, well, why don't you do it? He said, no, I'm not going to do it. Let him do his own calling. <laughs> now, it, later on, I have wondered why Colwell uh, extended that invitation to him. And I've wondered, uh, I've since become rather suspicious of these scholars. And I wondered whether he did it perhaps to find some little error in the collation process, which is not always so easy, and that then he could publish to the world, well, Hills made a mistake in this collation, and so continue uh, the, the, the reputation that he evidently wanted to engender. But, but that's merely a, a, a 
question in my own mind. Nevertheless, he did get that invitation. Yes, it's, it's not too far off the mark. Uh, uh, another backdrop to this whole story, which I am now recalling that I neglected to tell you, is that one of the reasons these publishing houses here in Grand Rapids were disinclined to give any sort of uh, publishing uh, advantage to Hills is because Bruce Metzger eventually would be on the uh, ch chairman, he would be chairman of the RSV committee. And also, at exactly that time, the plan to hatch what would become the new international version, which Zondervan would be the driving financial force behind, was also under discussion at exactly that time. I've also mentioned that in my book here. So you can see how, for, for marketing purposes, if Hills is out there, uh, and his critique of the Westcott and Hort theory is out there, uh, that would have cut right into the popular acceptance of a translation like the NIV uh, into which project Zondervan was piling much seed money in advance to get the project up and running. All of this was happening at exactly the same time. And that's one of the considerations, and they're not wanting his book to see the light of day. Um, I've been asked to repeat, the question was, uh, did Fuller and Hills ever meet, and yes, they did. Dr. Hills came to Wealthy Street Baptist Church and spoke there on at least two occasions. Uh, and so they did meet, and uh, they did collaborate in the publishing of the book, uh, which Bible, to which Hills uh, uh, gave a chapter, a very important chapter. It's very interesting. Uh, Dr. Fuller invited uh, my husband to come up and give his testimony, you know, which is very common in Baptist churches, and it's very good practice. I'm not denigrating it, but um, it, he actually did not give his personal testimony in regard to his faith in the Lord, which was very strong. However, for the benefit of the congregation, he did give them a little brief review of the problems concerned and of the necessity of the retaining the King James Version over against the modern version movement, which already at that time was coming into the foreground. So I thought you might be interested in that little note. Well, this is certainly a unique opportunity. Uh, I, I hope all of you have read Dr. Hill's book. And uh, do, do you have any questions about his overall position? Uh, because he's been very much misrepresented both by those who would be his advocates on the far right uh, and, and, and those who choose not to accept what he actually taught on the left. For example, Bruce Metzger, in a footnote in his handbook on New Testament text criticism, has to acknowledge Hills, but is so dismissive of him that all he comments on is that Hills even goes so far as to defend the three heavenly witnesses in 1 John. And that's as far as Metzger goes. And he doesn't qualify his assessment of that by pointing out to the reader that Hills uh, argued for it as best as he could as a probability and never gave absolute certainty because there wasn't the kind of evidence that there is for other passages in the Byzantine text. And so he did carefully couch his argument and qualify it as a high probability, but never absolutely affirmed it. But Metzger leaves the impression in his footnote that Hills unqualifiedly endorsed that as, as authentic in Johannine. And uh, it shows poor scholarship on the part of Bruce Metzger at that point. Edward Hills has been accused of being something called KJV only, uh, which is an extreme uh, group in the far right of Baptist, almost exclusively Baptist separatist communities who uh, exalt the English of the authorized version above the Hebrew and the Greek and uh, argue in, in very severe rhetorical language. Uh, but aren't terribly grounded in the actual details of, of the evidence. And here's the absurdity of this proposition. When Hills published his book in 1956, 
There was no trained text critic advocating Bergon's views at that point in history that I know of. He was a sole, solitary figure. And on the basis of his understanding of text criticism, he therefore also defended the authorized version as being the best translation from the best text. There was no one else, no other community advocating uh, over against the modern translations, the KJV, in a systematic way that I know of. And now, there were various communities using the King James, and, you know, but there was no public advocacy of it over against the modern translations. Hills was a solitary figure in that endeavor. Now, to take a movement that, that emerged 25 or 30 or 40 years later and to project it back on Edward Hills and say Edward Hills is KJV only it, it is just a, a maligning tactic of, of irresponsible um, uh, defamation as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and people like James White and, and these other would-be apologists for, for the uh, critical text and modern language English Bibles will do anything to keep people from understanding what he actually taught by, by uh, uh, connecting him with reprehensible, irresponsible extremists on the far right. Um, if anybody who reads Dr. Hill's work will know that he's not to be compared with these groups who borrow his name, who selectively use his research, but aren't interested in embracing his overall, overall arguments or data. And I think that's unfortunate. And I, I began this, this morning's session by telling you that that's one of the reasons we're hosting this conference just now, is to put these men in their own context and ask that they be read, studied, and understood in their own terms, rather than as they have been misappropriated by the right and misrepresented by the left. Is there any observation on the part of faith communities in America to recognize that these publishers have released a kind of confusion and chaos in the church because there's so many confi conflicting translations of the Bible. And if not, why don't they recognize this? And I think the answer is, and I tried to, uh, in, in a humorous vein last night, when I showed that picture of the very mournful Christ on the screen, point out that the author's claim in that book is the reason Jesus was so sad is because he was fatherless. You know, he was a single parent child, which is sort of a, a way to make Christ uh, relevant to our contemporary sociological context and make him, uh, em make people empathetic with him because, uh, you know, we're aware of, of, of some of the plights of our own s social situations in the contemporary setting. And, and, and that, uh, that tends in the direction that I think explains how the notion of diversity is a good thing in contemporary culture. You know, we want to be inclusive. And if catering to diversity is considered a good high value in our, in our social conduct, then more is better. As many Bibles as you can produce that will appeal to various disparate groups, then you are being inclusive and the gospel is thereby enhanced. Its benefits are uh, more readily uh, appreciated and received. Rather than have the value uh, that Paul demands in 1 Corinthians when he says, Brethren, I would that you all spoke with one mind and with one common judgment. And he rebuked the Corinthian church because of the diversity that was emerging, the conflicts and the personality cults. And he said, I want you, he explicitly said, I want you to all be of one mind and have one common judgment on things. And how could they possibly have one mind and have one common judgment on values and, and morals and so forth if they weren't reading from a common source of authority? And so this modern notion that diversity is good and, and inclusiveness is good and we need a Bible for every niche uh, of, of, of social order in the United States, even though it causes a kind of conflict and chaos, this is good chaos, that value flies right into the face of the Bible's own values and teachings.
which requires of us to be of one mind. We cannot be of one mind reading from diverse and divergent accounts of Scripture. Yeah, the question is, um, since we know that Hills has, is not part of the extremist right of the separatist community, um, in principle, he probably would not be opposed to producing a modern English edition of the TR. Well, his own words are, are the best source to go to, and of course, uh, if you'll get his book, you'll see what he said on that score. He said, yeah, there are some archaisms, that is, words that have um, actually changed meaning over time and therefore aren't as helpful as they might be. And he suggests several ways of updating that, uh, either in the margins or, or uh, through footnotes or so, so forth. He, he was less sympathetic towards a, a, an overall revamping of the text um, because he didn't think it required that. And if you look at the precedent of other Renaissance translators from Tyndale right up through the authorized version, when you realize that the AV is nine-tenths Tyndale, you realize that Hills is completely in tune with that precedent from the Renaissance period. And that is, if Tyndale captured accurately what is in the Greek or the Hebrew, we needn't fiddle with it to make it contemporary speech. And I would also recommend to you a book by uh, George Steiner, um, a marvelous intellect, um, a master of English literature, who teaches at the University of Geneva and at Oxford, and has been a visiting professor at Harvard, in his book, After Babylon, where he discusses the archaisms of the authorized version, how it was archaic when it came off the press, while the ink was still wet. And obviously, if nine-tenths of it is Tyndale, obviously it was archaic. In other words, a lot of the vocabulary was no longer part of conversational English. And Steiner lists in an entire page all kinds of archaic aspects um, uh, of the King James Version and, and, and lauds this as a positive development, that because they preserved the quaintness of this language, they re retained the delightfulness of the literary perfection that had been attained there. And so uh, most people don't realize the arc that, that the AV was purposefully archaic when it came from the press. They were not driven by this notion that it must mirror contemporary conversational colloquial English. Their values were different. Their values were preservative. And if the language evolves to the extent where there's massive discontinuity between conversational English, or even literary English, and the authorized version, Hill says, then we must take in hand to update it. But until that day comes, uh, we can make the necessary adjustments with the archaisms that exist in more modest ways, and in less intrusive ways. And his was the, the, the most conservative of all options. Now, others have produced updated editions of the AV where there's been a systematic updating of all the archaisms in the text itself. There's a Bible called the King James 21 with various typefaces that I'm not happy with, but they've done that. They've systematically updated the entire Bible, ridding it of archaisms without changing the text, without doing away with these and thous, as the new King James Bible did. And I also mentioned last night that Cambridge University is right now in the process of updating the authorized version to rid it of a number of archaisms. And whether that will be a sufficiently conservative work or whether it will represent a radical departure from the earlier revisions of the AV that have taken place since 1611, at least three previous revisions, it remains to be seen. I know the man who's working on the updating of it, and I know, he to, know him to be an extremely accomplished man, and I know that the values he's working with will be consonant with, with the way the AV has been updated in the past, but the end product well, we'll have to wait, wait and see. The question was, th there is uh, another edition of an updated Bible uh, of the King James Version of the King James called the King James Version 2000 uh, that has done a thorough systematic updating of the language. But uh, in, my, in my response is I haven't done a thorough investigation of it, but it, it appears to be a sufficient work. Uh, and I probably would prefer their double columns, traditional double columns, and uniform typeface as opposed to the KJ-21, which attempts to look very modern and, and uses at least four different typefaces that 
I, I'm not happy with, and most people aren't either. But the, in principle, what they did in terms of updating was a good, a good job. And uh, for people who psychologically are in bondage to some notion that they can't read thee and thou, uh, so one of these updated versions would be a sufficient alternative, I would think, until Cambridge gives us what they're doing. In connection with the letter uh, which uh, the University of Chicago received from Columbia Seminary, yes. um, when my husband applied there, they would not, he wanted to write on the doctrine of inspiration. So you can see it, his consistency. He wanted to show that the Bible transmission, manuscript transmission, and manuscript translation should be based upon two biblical principles, the doctrine of divine inspiration and preservation. And he wanted to use uh, he wanted to receive a degree, a master's degree, in uh, uh, explaining the doctrine of uh, providential inspiration. And they said no. And they would not allow him to write a thesis on that subject. Mm -hmm. So you this can definitely. Columbia Seminary. Pardon me? This was at Columbia Seminary. Yes, exactly. at Columbia Seminary. So you can uh, plainly see the same suppression that occurred in Burgon's day is occurring today. Uh, seminaries wish entirely to ignore the doctrines of inspiration and preservation. And unless those doctrines are upheld, we're going to have an entirely different interpretation of the manuscript evidence and the way they are transmitted and, the, and also the translation. Thank you all for your patience and for coming. And I trust you will bone up and buy these books and then make them available to others as well so that we can have uh, at least a core of educated people who are not going to be exploited by the modern evangelical publishing world.